I was lucky to grow up in a family that couldn't afford fancy vacations because instead we went to a primitive beach cottage my dad and uncle had helped my grandfather build when they were just boys. To reach this place of magic, we had to negotiate the fearsome Red Hill, the place we'd slip and slide and often get stuck. It was this clayey soil that the local tribe used to build rondavals, their mud-patterned round homes dotting the hills. It's these childhood memories that have me mapping a route to take my heart on an American road trip. I remember watching a group of African women, babies strapped on their backs, building, and in the process passing skills from one generation to the next, while in between their happy mud play, small children helped. What they built with was provided courtesy of Mother Earth. There was a flow and a natural rhythm in making, passing and placing material. Neighbours helped neighbours and everyone felt needed, felt useful. It stopped me in my tracks, that palpable sense of purpose and community, as shared stories and abundant laughter echoed through the valleys. I'm worried that in our Western world we are losing things so valuable that no money could ever buy them. Creativity, connection and community building. I'm worried that people will never know the joy of a body deliciously weary from toiling or the sense of accomplishment that comes with seeing a war grow. And I worry that housing has become so hugely unaffordable. And that's why I'm on a mission to tell the story of creating magic and homes for pennies on the dollar. I think we're in trouble. I don't know how people are going to afford conventional housing in the future. Fewer and fewer people can, and as a result, these housing refugees essentially will search different ways. More and more are choosing to become homeless, which is very tragic. As a young person, we're faced with a very large conundrum of how can we afford property? It's extremely hard, if not nearly impossible for most people. Some of them decide to do what a lot of people in the natural building world are doing, is to build themselves a little cop cottage in somebody's backyard and do it that way. Um, the tiny house movement is a I think a result of that, where people say, for a couple of thousand bucks I can buy a trailer and with some scrap wood build a little cabin on top. The affordability factor of living tiny is, is massive. The average cost of a home in the U.S. I think is somewhere around $230,000 or something like that. The average cost of a tiny house, which, you know, tiny to small, somewhere in that area, is right around, I think it's about 35000 or, or maybe 40000 So, I mean, right off the bat, there's a huge difference in cost. What doesn't get factored into those initial numbers is that most people, when they build their house or buy a house, they buy it on a 30-year mortgage. So if you look at the numbers, when you buy a house or build it on a 30-year mortgage, by the time you're done, you've bought your house three times. So the amount of that, let's say it's a $220,000 house, no it's not, it's a $660,000 house. That's a massive amount of debt. So I'd say natural building is one piece of a way that people can step out of what feels like a trap. A trap in which they are required to continue working full-time jobs, multiple part-time jobs, working many, many hours at 
something that is not in their control and doesn't directly benefit them primarily in order to make money, in order to pay other people to do the things that they need to do to live. I was forced to work in a job making minimum wage, which is not by any means what someone can comfortably live by in America. At the same time of dramatic study cost increases, government funding has plummeted, leaving students and parents swimming in student debt, often with no way of repaying in a poor job market. We're shackled in the way that we are not given freedom to provide for our own necessities without going through um, an organized, overseen structure that funnels everybody into a, a similar process of standardization. And so seeing that I had to work and throw my money into something that didn't give back to me except for just for that short moment. So $500 a month just for this month of rent. And then again, I'm at starting place zero. My in, What I'm investing into is not giving back to me or the people around me in any way except for the owner of the property. I think more and more people feel that the, the equation of working to pay for a house that you cannot spend any time in because you have to work so hard is not good anymore. I think there was a time when the rewards were actually pretty sweet. Um, you could still question them, but you know, I would say um, when I was growing up, one person could work and you got a decent house out of that and some free time and so forth, but that's long gone. And uh, as a result, we have a very minute, the 10% 10, 10 of the population that has gotten extremely rich and the rest of us are trying to figure it out. Living debt free is possibly the best thing we've ever done. We have one credit card because you can't rent a car with a debit card <laughs> in most places. And there's something incredibly freeing about having that, what, I, what we call financial freedom. So there, there are two main things that happen when you don't have to worry about a mortgage. One is that, uh, so for us, we can choose to keep working at the same level we're working now, and that will generate much more income for us because it's not every month going away. Uh, and, and not only just the mortgage, but let, let's assume that you built a small house and you're on the grid, your utility costs will be far less to heat and cool a 300 square foot house than it will be to a, a 7,000 square foot house, which those exist way too often. Uh, so that cost is lower. Um, all of those costs become lower. So when they have lower costs, you can keep your income at the same level and have more money that you keep. And when you have more money, you can choose to travel, which is what we love to do. Um, you know, you can choose to invest in certain things that you really like investing in, whether it be really nice, high quality furniture or that car you've always dreamed of that you couldn't afford before. All of that becomes an option now. Um, the amount of money that you save, if you just think about in your own house, uh, if you took your mortgage and just made it go away and you took your utilities and, and let's say you just factored it down by lowering it by 75%, now what are your utility costs? I mean, that's amazing. And so if you just looked at that and said, every month I did that, by the end of the year, I'd have this much more if I kept my income the same, that's a lot. So that's one approach. The other side of things is that I don't have to work as much anymore. And that's even more fun. In a small home, you have far less expense uh, it's comfortable, you know, you get to know your partner. You're not a stranger in your own home. You just feel good, you know, you feel like you're really living. And I think with living in this cop house, it's really changed our lives. We thought we were, we were going to spend six months there. We said, let's just try for six months. <laughs> and it's been eight years, so, <laughs> so, so it, really, it really attests to the fact that you know, uh, people from big houses can live in small places. It's very important that we figure out what our needs are and provide for the basic level of comfort that we need 
and downsize so that we don't have these extravagant expenses and these you know giant energy consuming homes and that we're aware and conscious of where we are exceeding what we need where we're using too much over our share it's important to live in a small space in a time when resources are rapidly diminishing the beginning of our story has to do with affordability in the sense that we had no money and we were living in a tent in a very extreme climate so um, COP was kind of an accident, it was something I tripped over. COP allows creativity to bloom and almost anything from benches to pizza ovens, newsstands, chicken coops and kitty hotels can be fashioned from it. There are many natural building methods and materials that are growing in popularity, from earth bags to rammed earth, wattle and daub, straw bale, light clay straw, and even recycled plastic bottles can be fashioned into bricks. Um, Cobb in particular I love because it has the power to retell our whole story about what the built environment is and how it relates to the natural world. I was searching for a natural building method that would give me the opportunity to build something on our land here with things that we had on the land here without having to go anywhere and buy anything. We're in a very remote place and um, when you can't afford to haul materials or buy materials or whatever, then you have to get really creative. So finding out about Cobb was just a little bit of research and, um, and a workshop. Single mom with three boys needing more space on her property than a one bedroom house to raise her kids. The only answer was Cobb. We bought this land 14 years ago and we wanted to build a permanent house. I had young kids, we lived in a tent. I just wanted to get a nice little house quickly, but I didn't want to do it conventionally. Cobb is extremely affordable. Yeah, um, it's close to nothing, honestly. I mean, depending on where you live and your, um, you know, your community, we dug, you know, a sizable pond with an excavator, cost of diesel, cost of rent an excavator, not much, couple hundred bucks. That gave us enough clay to build two 120 square foot Cobb cottages that have a loft in them that two people could easily live in. Um, I think, you know, the the overall cost of the Cobb house that we made was maybe $2,200. It's affordable because you're using materials right from your land. So I, I have built houses, the Hobbit Hut, the Gingerbread House. I didn't spend any more than $500 on, the, you know, on those houses because it was just all using earth right from the property. Uh, natural building is a radical departure from um, what we in industrialized countries see around us as the norms with which most buildings are built these days. The building technologies and culture that are thriving, most thriving in the industrial world now, are ones that are designed to minimize labor because we have this conception that time is money. And if you're hiring, a, if you're hiring people to build your house, most of your expenses are gonna be in labor as compared to materials. Natural building turns that equation on its head, I think, Using materials in their raw form, whether it's earth or unmilled wood or natural stone, it, it's going to take a lot more time to assemble those than if you're starting with 2x4s and concrete blocks and plywood. If you are living in that belief system that time is money, 
it doesn't it doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense in the same way that growing your own food doesn't make sense or even raising your own children it's not economically viable it's 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 better economics to to hire somebody to take care of your kids while you get a high paying job i think the ability for folks to build a home with the material under their feet connects you to place in a way that shipping in materials from other geographic regions does not. A lot of the way we build contemporarily, the actual inhabitant of the house is not very involved in many steps of the process, especially the acquisition of the building materials. And connecting oneself with that process and with that material can be a, a magical experience when knowing your building and living and being with your building over time. You know, when you're working with normal building materials, there's such a linear thinking uh, that they all look the same. Um, you know, you might put an angle here, angle there that's different from another house. But pretty much the houses are made the same, you know. But inside the cob, you know, it's, you can see the hand prints, you can, you know, and the light hits it every, every day, at every different parts of the day, the light hits it differently and you get a whole different look. And it brightens up your your day just by just by being in there, you know. So it it just gives you such great feelings of of being connected with uh, with nature. In more recent time, there's there's definitely been a disconnect between people and and the homes that they live in. It used to be very common for people to build their own shelter and with their family members and, and that's where they would live. But now the, the homes are built by other people and they're financed by the banks and so you know you first have to go to the bank and get approved before you can buy a shelter for yourselves and for your family and you absolutely have no part in, in the building of this, of this structure. I'd say the magic of being intimately involved in constructing your own project is very similar to many forms of art or other very human-based pursuits. When you take something from beginning to end or take part in the process of it uh, from its birth to its completion, there is a relationship that you have with that project. I am firmly convinced that indigenous cultures that stayed put in the same place for multiple generations came up with the best possible ways to meet their needs with the stuff that was available to them. So I don't think that there's any traditional building system that doesn't have something to teach us. We've been cut off from being able to feed ourselves and knowing where our own water comes from. And we've also been cut off from being able to provide shelter for ourselves. And, and every creature on the face of the planet does those three things for themselves, always. They know where to find water, they know how to eat, and they know what kind of cave or nest or bed to sleep in. And I think that our spirit calls to that and, and knows that, that we know how deep down inside and that we're supposed to do that for ourselves. This is in our DNA. Everyone every living sentient being has the knowledge to create their nest. The largest adobe structure in Northern California is General Vallejo's old adobe fortress. Going there as a child, I remember being fascinated by the whole concept of using earth right from the property to go and use that for the walls. And then not having to buy any cement, not buying any wood, no construction other materials, it's just, just earth, right? Readily available. I remember as a child being fascinated by that concept. The children were elated uh, I mean, it was an amazing thing to watch the kids. They loved to make cob and they got to where they could supervise, like they would throw a, a brick back if it didn't pass their pull test. Uh, we had one, I think, nine-year-old at the time that was very concerned about putting the cob up against the wood and the sustainability factor. What is it about cob that makes people built with it almost automatically, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. It just seems like stacking mud up 
like that is actually real, real simple. We had to kind of make it, make it up, how to cob. And it was so successful, this making it up, remembering from intuition or instinct, really. Our society has always more or less expressed that conventional building is for men. You know, women cannot do that. And so the women that do go into building have to overcome that and, and say, no, that's, you know, that's not true. Women can build just as finely as men. <laughs> but with mud building, we don't have any of that. And that probably consequently, um, I would say the majority, more than half my students are women. Um, because I think it's, uh, it's an open field for women, there's no judgment, there's no, uh, yeah, there's no negative baggage. So I think that really helps. As an owner builder, you can build your own, own home with very little money. This house behind us here, the Laughing House, we call it a starter house, with the idea that you take a workshop or read a book or get inspired by somebody and you can go out and get started. And this particular house was designed around um, people that have no building experience and could build something like this for um, 5,000 bucks in a building year with two people who've never built before. Building with natural materials and teaching other people about natural materials is a way to reconnect with what I think it actually is to be human. For most people that come to the workshops, or most people in general, they were told that they are, cannot build. They're not allowed to, they're not qualified, they're not certified, they haven't been educated. And I think when they come to my workshops, I give them permission to build. And that's often the only thing that people need, is just permission to do it. But the ones that I'm really excited about are the ones that come through that just kind of came about it in maybe a roundabout way and didn't really know. And in nine short day workshop, they are so empowered when they leave to build their own house. Um, we had a young man in the last workshop that he was so discouraged by society, he was ready to run to the woods and um, just not be part of society. And after nine days, he was so thrilled that he could build a house. And he's actually going up to his uncle's land right now and is going to build. And so instead of someone running away from society, it empowers, especially young people, um, that they can do something. They can make a difference. and. You know, it really gives them something to share with others. I really encourage people to use their imagination to create the house slash lifestyle that they want. And so we do have conversations about this and little exercises and we make models. By the end of the time they've created these beautiful models and they want to take you on a tour of their their little miniature house and they're all excited and you know sharing and dreaming and instead of worrying oh is this right is this wrong or am I okay it's like they just get they get so empowered by their own excitement and creativity and allowing themselves to dream and do things. I came up with a little exercise I call sculpting sacred space or intuitive design that um, allows anybody to um, bring forth really what they want to design and build and create in their life uh, without thinking about it. <laughs> so uh, what we start with is a cob ball. And I asked people to remember a magic spot that it, it was so, so special to them in their lifetime. And what we're trying to do is allow people to bring that magic back into their life from the places that created so much magic for them. 
Um, so I asked my students to just put their hands on, on the cob ball and um, after reflecting on these magical places and the qualities, just play a little magic trick and ask their hands to just do what they want to do and watch what wants to happen. Like, hands, show me. Show me what wants to happen here. It's it almost be. like your hearts and hands connect when you just get your, uh, your mind out of the way and just want to see what, what comes through. My father was really inspired by shapes in nature. And he would say, you know, we're building with the natural elements, earth, water, air, fire, and there's nothing ugly in nature. You know, you've never seen an ugly flower or an ugly tree. And sort of by using those principles and these natural materials, he tried to find ways that were very organic to, to build things that were familiar. And then too, on the physical level, you'll see people, you know, developing confidence in their physicalness and their ability to work and just their ability to build a house. You know, most people don't think they can build a house. And by the end of a workshop, they're like, oh, I can do this. It's just one handful at a time or one shovel full at a time. And so I think a lot of what is transformative is just people's need to be useful and to contribute and feeling like they can actually do it and Cobb is just a really easy vector for that. In addition to learning self-empowerment, another thing actually that our culture has challenges with is asking for help and asking for friends and neighbors and, and complete strangers to come help you build your house. And it turns out that people want to help. People want to feel useful. People want to feel like they're part of a community. I remind them, when you go home, this is the one building project where you're going to have people knocking on your door or your tent and saying, can I please help for free? You start building anything, whether it's a bench or an oven or a small structure or a big house, for miles around people hear about it and they want to come help. <laughs> you have to close the gate and put a sign that says please stay away or they'll, they'll be helping you. <laughs> so there's a social element there that um, I've never experienced in anything else I've ever done in my life. You know, um, there's just a, a deep need for people to come together and make something so, so important to our lives as a shelter to live in. A hundred more people built, made little balls of mud on this house and it it invites and opens up to uh, community. So I think the whole concept there, and once you've really tasted community, it's not very pleasing to stay very distant. I think being able to expose people to this kind of idea that no, you have everything you need to be able to build a shelter for yourselves and that it's a basic human right that you should be able to do that if necessary or if just that you want to. You could build something non-toxic and very beautiful using just the material that's right there on your site. That you don't even need to outsource that material. That 90% of what you need is right there. That that's true sustainability. There's an incredible amount of clay on earth if you would take all the clay in the earth and wrap it around the earth like peanut butter around an apple, it would be a mile thick. For me, in my experience, the greatest source of joy in my life is gratitude. When I feel grateful, I feel joyful. And a huge source of gratitude in my life, there's many, 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 many things I'm grateful for. But one of them is the recognition that the earth provides, that all of our needs as, as human animals are provided for by the earth. I think our relation with clay soil is very special. Our biological memory has built in a relation to clay, not just through pottery and the way we've been building houses for probably 10,000 years. Uh, our scientists now are beginning to think that uh, even the transition from non-life to life and evolution was facilitated by clay because it's a magical material and so it's it's an extremely important substance for us in our human history and that's built into our brain that relation and so I think when we 
when we pick up the clay, we immediately are attracted to it. My legs were sore, my thumbs were sore. I just couldn't stop. It was just like this insane, instant addiction. The, the feeling that people have about natural building materials, it often does relate to an experience they had in, in their younger days. But I think it, it goes back even further than that. So you can look at uh, the humans collectively as a species going back hundreds and thousands of years where, where the only way to build was, was sustainably and uh, building green, that, that was the way everyone built, was building green, building sustainably. The, the pre-industrialized revolution, that's, it was building with natural materials. And, and so I, I do think that the, those feelings that people have for natural materials, they do extend back to their earlier days, but I think even more so the early days of humanity. During the workshops, in the very beginning, people are extremely awkward with it. And then suddenly something clicks and suddenly they refound that relation with earth and clay soil and building and suddenly it, everybody's just doing it. I was amazed at the freedom that comes with uh, sculpting a structure. Earthen building, uh, permaculture, organic gardening, all of those things empower people to provide for those needs and not rely on others for meeting those needs and have to pay a service forward. When I began to apprentice in natural building, immediately was that curiosity, that creativity, that feeling that comes from the materials. This beauty you see in the wood, you're revealing what you are. You are this beauty. What are you, what are we building? Hmm? When we craft, when I craft a, when I craft a tree into a timber, into a home, who's being crafted? When we bring our attention present, then greatness comes out of that. What is it about mud buildings that affects people so strongly? And at this point, you know, after 10 years of doing this, I've had the opportunity to watch people from across the, the you know, across the spectrum walk into a mud building and say, what is going on here? So what, what is that difference? Even seeing a cob project being made or seeing a cob house or feeling a cob house, it seems to inspire just about everyone across the board, no matter who they are. They, it, they recognize it as something real or I don't know. It's, it's almost like it's familiar even though they've never seen it. It's like a deja vu from a different era that seems to affect everyone. I saw my first cob house and I just fell in love with it. <laughs> I thought, I've never seen something like this and I think I can do this. It looks natural, it looks not uh, measured or um, angular and it looks like it's been just, just come out of the ground and it's very harmonious with the environment and it looked simple. In the natural building world, you will hear this, mm, this phrase, build something that loves you back. Or Becky B, how the Cobb home is like receiving a big hug. I had gone for decades down to Bright, uh, Brighton Bush Hot Springs and Yonto Evans of Cobb Cottage had built a project down there for them and I fell in love with the material. It was so beautiful and it smelled so good and I felt I'd never been in a round structure. I felt so at home there and at the time I you know had a big job in a 4,000 square foot house and teenage boys that had you know we had the uh, saxophone on one level and baby grand on the other and I fell in love with small and I fell in love with earthen. Living in a 
in a handcrafted home or eating all of your meals out of bowls that were made out of clay by somebody that you know eating with a spoon that you carved yourself creates a level of connectedness with the world and with the environment that doesn't exist if you are surrounded by stuff that you don't know what it is and you don't know where it came from. You feel like you are at home because you know every part of what went into the creation of your home. I remember when I drove away from that workshop how much I wanted to get back to Cobb and being in nature and working together with people. And there's something so bonding, it has such a bonding agent quality to it to be able to work with other people together and be able to create something together as a team. The Cobb House brought people together in the way of empowering people to become sensorial, to become engaged in their surroundings. Uh, I've often thought that any kind of diplomatic efforts between warring countries they should co-op together. They should, they should build a co-op oven together. I mean, get, get the Israelis and Palestinians together and have them build a co-op oven. You, you can't be enemies with somebody who you're stomping in a cob with and baking bread and pizzas with in an oven that you helped build yourself. You know, and I felt so friendly to everybody. It was like I wanted to pick up every hitchhiker and talk to all the people. It was like it just changed. It made me old-fashioned. Just a week of insane cobbing. For me, this is not about building. It's sharing the joy. It's sharing the joy of just finding your gift, whatever it is. It might not even be about building. Cobb specifically is extremely accessible. The practice of actually building a Cobb wall is very non-technical. You don't have to do much math, you don't have to have very many specialized tools, you don't have to have a lot of familiarity with tools and construction systems. I think that's one of the biggest, the most disempowering parts of the conventional building industry is that people walking by a construction site see all the tools in use which get more and more complicated and more and more technical and don't understand them. With Cobb, the tools that you need to use to build with Cobb are a shovel, a machete, a tarp, a hose, a wheelbarrow. They're very, very accessible to people. Um, people who have not previously felt like they had the capacity to build a house for themselves walk onto a Cobb site and they understand what's happening very, very quickly and they feel comfortable. When people leave the workshops, I think they, they feel extremely uplifted because many of the things that they were not allowed to do, they thought they couldn't do, um, suddenly were possible. And it's interesting, I think you can probably experience the same thing going to an art workshop or to a singing workshop. But the difference with building is that it's not only not only are they allowed to do it now, and they learned how to do it, or relearned how to do it, but it also involves um, a basic survival thing like shelter. So it also makes them feel very secure and and uh, self-sufficient and and confident in life uh, because they they now know how to build their own shelter. Jeffrey Normal says a lot of what passes for depression today is nothing more than the body saying it needs work. As a psychologist, I think he has a point. I've personally witnessed the healing powers of building. I've seen people go into a meditative trance working on a wall, only to find value but forgotten parts of themselves. On one occasion we had a young autistic man building with a group on a cob cottage. After a few days he was just another part of the crew fitting in like he belonged, and awfully proud of the walls and ladder he'd been a part of building. Building has magical healing properties. Jean Veneer describes it this way, when we pool our strength and share the work and responsibility, we can welcome many people, even those in deep distress, and perhaps help them find self-confidence and inner healing. 
One of the great things about natural building, uh, you know, in this kind of work, is the the transformational element that it has on people. I've often thought, actually, that this should be something that therapists prescribe to their clients. I have seen amazing stuff in tears. I get, I mean, I get, I'm drawn to tears and choking up. You know, where somebody says, you know, man, I wish I'd done this 20 years ago. Oh, you have to see it to believe it. What I have seen is such a long story and so many stories and so amazing. Where do I start? Um, okay, I go to Ecuador and I'm doing a, a lesson. And all the people show up, you know, clean with their notebooks and their pens and they get all organized and they sit down like they've been properly taught. And I just laughed at them. And they were so, yes ma'am, professora, you know, they were so trained to be good students, you know, scholarly. And by the end of the time, I the, the creativity that they put into that building, the railings, the artwork, the fun. They were not the same people at all. They're filthy, laughing, just power. We built this huge thing. It, it, it just, words can't describe it, you know? I had a 60-year-old, 62-year-old man, and he decided to take this workshop. And at the final day, when we graduated, this guy was just so in tears when he started to say what this has meant to him, working to, together like a family. He just lost it, you know, he was so emotional. It seems to bring up an ease with talking about things that are deep and meaningful that do doesn't ordinarily happen, you know, in everyday life. We owe a lot to those early pioneers, be it Nader Kalili, Becky B, Michael Smith, but in particular, we owe a lot to Linda Smiley and Yontu Evans. Without them, Cobb may never have made it to North America. Initially, we started because we were horrified at the use of wood. Houses take a lot of the lumber production in this country. We, we taught a few workshops where we lived, and then we, we ran around the world teaching in other places. We realized that what we really needed was a good school of natural building in the US. I remember at some meeting with 150 natural builders there, I was bitching about there being no school of natural building and 150 fingers came and pointed at me. John John Dai, director of Pun Pun, the organics farm in Thailand, says, people who are cleverer than me and get a job need to work for 30 years to have a house. But for me, who cannot finish university, how can I have a house? But when I start to do earthing buildings, it's so easy. I spend two hours per day, and in three months, I have a house. A friend who is the most clever in the class, he has a house too, but he has to be in debt for 30 years. In my heart, I know with absolute certainty that small owner-built homes using on-site materials could solve huge world problems. Problems like affordable homes and building methods that are kind to our planet and better for people too. Building literally builds stronger bodies and stronger minds. It empowers and frees people from being slaves to a mortgage. It gives people purpose, a sense of belonging. It builds rich social connections and strong and involved communities. And most of all, it fosters creativity and makes the world what E.E. E. Cummings calls mudlicious and puddle wonderful. <laughs> <laughs>